Vivek. I can tell you that those of us who've been involved in planning this evening have uh, swapped many um, guesses over the last number of weeks as to whether we would have 30 people here tonight or 300 people here tonight. And uh, we are really gratified that so many of you uh, thought the topic and our presenter was worth your Tuesday evening. So welcome to Northeast Texas Community College. Um, I'm also really happy to see so many of our community leaders, the men and women that we depend on in turbulent times, to be here this evening. Because we depend on you to set wise policy and to help make the important issues visible to our neighbors and friends who may be unaware of some of the implications of, uh, of these kinds of, of events, weather events and so forth. Uh, I have only spotted a couple of our board members, but I did want to mention to you that this evening Mr. Sid Greer is here. He's on the uh, NTCC Board of Trustees, and uh, Mr. John Bryan, I think I saw John. Um, okay. <laughs> you don't want to do that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. Bryan's here, so I appreciate both of you being here. Uh, we're happy to host Dr. Nielsen Gammon on the topic of interest, obviously, to many of us. Tonight's presentation is a kickoff of sorts for us. We determined last fall that our region needed a set of workshops and short courses focused on living through a drought with the understanding that water-related issues will become the dominant political and practical issue in this state uh, for a long time. Uh, into our future, even after this immediate drought is finished. We recognize that many in our community have never lived through a protracted drought since they became adults. And now they own and manage acreages. Many live outside of town with septic systems and water wells. And often these folks, like myself, were raised in the city with literally no prior responsibility for uh, managing the land and for taking care of systems that can be impacted by water shortages. We're partnering with the Titus County Fresh Water District and the Northeast Texas Municipal Water District to bring you tonight's session. Thank you to Walt Sears and Daryl Grubbs for their help on this project. I hope you find it practical and useful. I also hope you'll take a moment while you're here to complete the survey on the back side of your program We'll use those results to help us determine whether there is an interest in additional presentations on water-related topics and what kind of information you want provided. This is your college. We exist to serve you in this surrounding region. Please let us know how we can do that. And now, Walt Sears, General Manager for the Northeast Texas Municipal Water District, uh, will introduce tonight's guest speaker. Walt. I do want to say on, on behalf of the district that we appreciate the college, Dr. Johnson, so if there is an applause out there, we ought to be thanking the college for the, the facilities and for their coordination and their help. Uh, and uh, I'll get right to the introduction. Uh, John Nelson Gammon is a professor of atmospheric sciences at Texas A&M University and College Station and serves as the Texas State Climatologist. He's been doing that since uh, 2000. The State Climatologist is also the designated member of the Texas Drought Preparedness Council. And I want to take a moment and say all of Texas has been suffering through this drought, but on a state level, we do have state leaders that do try to uh, prepare us for that. And I want to thank him for his role as a state leader on that subject. I appreciate that. He is uh, a uh, member of several professional organizations. He teaches weather forecasting and climatology and does research in computer modeling, drought monitoring, historical data quality, and jet streams. He also writes a blog on the weather and climate issues for the Houston Chronicle, 
called the climate abyss. So Dr. Gannings, if you can give us some information. Thank you. Okay, talking about drought and climate weather in general is a pretty broad subject, so I'm glad I'm just essentially kicking off the uh, this series because there's no way I can touch on all the information. What I'm going to focus on is uh, a summary of the drought as it unfolded in the state, um, how usual or unusual it is in a historical perspective, which means beyond most of our lifetimes, and then transition into what the outlook is for the future and give you some understanding of um, the science behind that outlook, how we, how we know what we do know and why we know as little as we do. So, um, this was basically the height of the drought back in September. This is the U.S. Drought Monitor, which um, has been around for about 11 years and has been adopted by the USDA for making decisions on who gets drought relief and who doesn't. So we pay a lot of attention to provide input on that for conditions on the ground within Texas. Um, and I'll call this the 2011 Texas drought. You can see from this map that it wasn't just Texas that was involved. It was uh, anywhere from Arizona to the Carolinas and from southern Kansas um, down to at least the border and actually all the way to central Mexico. We happen to be right in the center of the drought during 2011. Things have improved a bit since then. Um, we've got uh, quite a bit of rain, especially in uh, north central and uh, parts of northeast Texas. If you came from, uh, come in here from north of the campus, you'd have more rain than if you drove in from south of the campus. You can be uh, envious or grateful, depending upon your situation. Um, but the drought is by no means over. Um, they're considering in uh, Next week's drought monitor actually is showing a fairly large expanse of northern Texas as being drought-free, which uh, hopefully is, is semi-permanent rather than temporary. But meanwhile, you've got areas that are labeled as uh, D4 or exceptional drought. Those are conditions that are supposed to happen uh, uh, maybe twice a century for a given type of drought. And uh, a lot more of the state is in exceptional drought than is, is out of drought at this time. Uh, here's a way I like to basically look at how severe the drought is historically statewide. And what we're doing here is we're looking at uh, every single um, December of the climate record, which goes all the way back to 1895. Every, everything I say that's a record or something like that comes from 1895 to the present. And each one of those lines shows the amount of rain on the... Uh, up and down axis versus uh, length of time over which it accumulated. So, for example, we care about the 12 months or one year's worth of rainfall in the December. Uh, that's the point along the x-axis to look at, and uh, you can see there's a range of possibilities for that that occurred historically. Uh, 2011 is in red. If you look at that value, um, it's uh, about 15 inches. So statewide, we received 15 inches during the 12 months ending in December. Um, we received about nine inches in the six months ending in December, and so forth. Uh, there's a couple more lines down there below the rest of the group. I mean, normally we get somewhere around 28, 29 inches of rainfall statewide. So we're talking about just a little bit more than half of normal rainfall. Um, and three years have had that. The one I talked about, the current one, red. Then in green is 1917, which, uh, depending upon which data set you use, still holds the record for driest calendar year. Uh, it was almost a century ago. And then 1956 is a year you're perhaps more familiar with. That was the uh, tail end of the drought of record. And uh, just, to, just to make the impact as bad as possible, the, the driest year of the drought was also the last year of the drought. So that was a drought of record for most parts of the state. Looking at a longer perspective, this goes all the way up to 48 months, and uh, really on the long term, this drought is not nearly as bad as, say, the 1956 drought was because it came on the heels of several dry years. So this is so far has been a short-term drought. It's by no means the worst drought that Texas has seen, 
Uh, but on a statewide basis, it pretty much ranks as the worst single year drought on record uh, because it did set the record for uh, driest 12 consecutive months, uh, and which uh, ended, unfortunately, into the summer. So it was as dry as it possibly could have been during the summer. We got statewide only a little more than 11 inches of rainfall during that 12 month period. And uh, looking across the state for that same period, pretty much every corner of the state had uh, extreme drought. In blue, we're looking at the amount of rain that fell during that 12 month period. Uh, the red columns right behind the blue ones are the previous record for the period. So this broke records throughout the state. Only the North Central Climate Region didn't quite manage to break its record. And all of those records are well below the normal value, which is the green column. So most of the state experienced half or less than half of its normal rainfall. The amount of rainfall in East Texas during 2011 corresponded to the amount of rain that normally falls in West Texas during a typical year as if there was such a thing as a typical year in Texas weather. <laughs> we started out fine back in September of 2010. Wet conditions are now a distant memory. <coughs> Except for eastern Texas, including this region, um, things were fairly dry during 2010. So actually, this is sort of um, a four-year drought as far as uh, the really major reservoirs go, such as Toledo Bend Reservoir. This is a product that we produce at the State Climate Office, which um, takes the rainfall estimates that the weather service produces and turns it into a drought product. So we can go right down to the four kilometer scale and see what's going on. And uh, at this time, everything was nice. The greens and blues indicate what are the normal conditions. And if there were a bunch of yellows and reds, that would be drier than normal. Three months later, end of December of 2010, Drought was spreading from East Texas across the state. Panhandle and South Texas were still doing fine. Uh, March, though, was the driest March on record, and now we're starting to see some extreme and exceptional drought conditions in many parts of the state. The first bad thing to happen was the winter wheat crop pretty much failed. The second bad thing to happen was wildfires started occurring in West Texas. Um, for West Texas, the, the wildfire conditions um, to set up to be a bad year, you want to have a wet year, so that there's a lot of growth of grasses and so forth, followed by a sudden dry year, so it all dries out and is ready to be burned. In East Texas, things are a little bit different, as I'll explain in a minute. Uh, stayed dry, March, April through June was the driest April through June on record. July through September was the driest July through September on record. And all of a sudden, this nice, colorful color scale we designed for this product is not working well anymore. Because every place almost is an exceptional drought. Um, getting close to the present time, this is the end of December of last year, of last year 2011. And uh, over the six month time scale, there are parts of the state doing well and parts doing poorly. And now the most recent plot shows over the past six months has actually been significantly above normal rainfall in the Dallas area, and at least uh, somewhat near normal, extending out into parts of East Texas. Um, but that's the tail end of the drought now that's been going on for over a year, so then I have to look at longer time scales. Um, the rain that initially occurs to, to perhaps end the drought or immediately the drought goes into soil moisture, which is good for farmers and ranchers, provides moisture for roots, provides moisture for planting. Not much of the initial rain goes into streams and lakes and reservoirs, so water supply issues continue um, long after farmers start being able to make use of the water. And then eventually the water supply issues resolve themselves if there's enough moisture that the rain can run off and flow into the reservoirs. Um, this is a, a plot of the, uh, uh, some reservoirs in the nearby area. This is Lake of the Pines, and unfortunately the tail end of the plot gets cut off, but presently um, we are running close to the uh, minimums experienced in 2005 and 2006, but we started to see some uh, improvement in, in uh, lake levels over the past month with the rains we've gotten. 
Lake Ray Hubbard, close to the, uh, Dallas Fort Worth, is actually, uh, that's cut up, it's actually about halfway back up to its capacity. And most of the lakes in the Dallas Fort Worth area are running at capacity now, so as far as they're concerned, um, the, the, the drought is, seems to be over, as long as it doesn't start up again soon. Now, so it was unusual in terms of rainfall. It was also unusual in terms of temperature. You may have noticed last year was kind of warm. This is a plot of rainfall during May through August versus temperature June through August statewide. And uh, I'm showing everything from 1895 through 2010, just because it's always fun to plot 2011 on this graph. It just doesn't belong with the rest of those points. It was uh, drier than it ever has been in the summer, and it was warmer by far. We came within a couple tenths of a degree of setting the all-time summer record for hottest summer in the lower 48 states. That record goes to Oklahoma in 2011. We did manage to snag the records for June and August, so we had the hottest June ever, not just Texas, but the contiguous states, and the same applies to August. So I knew if you thought it was hot, it was hot. Um, I looked around at where, where in the world you actually get this combination of heat and rainfall normally. And the closest uh, analog I could come up with for East Texas was, uh, was Pakistan. Uh, so that, that's your climate, so you may as well start wearing loose fitting clothing if this sets up again next year. Um, although, in truth, there are parts of the there are some, some parts of East Texas, there's no place in the world that had weather like that. Mainly because if this were to happen year after year, you wouldn't be able to support the trees that are present and you'd have a much different ecosystem. Fortunately, as you can see, this is an outlier. Um, and it was caused, at least in part, by La Nina. So let me talk a little bit about that. These are some maps of the uh, sea surface temperature departures from normal in the Pacific Ocean. You can see Australia over there on the lower on the left of each one of these panels, um, North and South America over on the right, and over on the uh, left-hand column are three sample uh, La Nina years from, from the past century, and on the right are three El Nino years. La Nina is when the Pacific Ocean is colder than normal along the equator. El Nino is where it's warmer than normal. And each, each one of these patterns is different, but they, they share some basic similarities, and they look sort of like mirror images of each other. And indeed, the impacts in the United States are pretty much mirror images of each other also. Uh, we can look at those impacts by just taking past historic La Nina years and, and averaging those conditions together and see how they differ from a normal year. So if we do that for rainfall for November through March, wintertime, uh, this is how the average La Nina conditions differ from the long-term normal conditions. Rainfall is less than, is more than five inches below normal along the Gulf Coast, and indeed it's drier than normal through most of the southern United States, except for this swath that uh, sort of originates near uh, Texarkana and extends up the Ohio River Valley. So, in terms of percentage departures from normal, uh, this corner of Texas has less of a La Nina influence, experiences less of an impact from La Nina than the rest of the state. Um, by the way, um, well, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, this is though the average conditions. It's an average of several years. Each year is going to be different because weather happens. And this is the, what happened during 2010 and 11. Uh, we actually had the second driest winter on record for Texas. Um, it was uh, drier in Texas than elsewhere, even though you wouldn't necessarily hone in on Texas in that composite. So we happened to be the unlucky state during last year's La Nina event. In addition to cool temperatures, you also tend to, I'm sorry, in addition to lack of rain, you also <coughs> have warmer temperatures than normal during La Nina. So this is the average temperature departure from normal. It runs about a degree, degree and a half Fahrenheit on average warmer throughout the state of Texas. And in a typical year, your results may vary. It was above normal through most of the southern United States, 
Uh, this was uh, ranked 94 out of where 116 would be the warmest on record, so fairly high up on the scale. Uh, you can find exceptions, in this case the southeast was cool, but it should have been warm. Okay, now, the, it's hard to keep La Nina and El Nino straight. The basic thing to remember is the LA in La Nina stands for Las Agua. Um, that's, that's how they call it La Nina, no, not really. Um, similarly, El Nino stands for extra liquid, so you can remember that relationship. Um, but it does seem <laughs> odd that a, something going on in the Pacific Ocean should have an effect on our weather. It's such a big effect. So I'm going to show this uh, video of um, basically take you back to, um, since this is an institutional higher education, take you back to grammar school days and remind you the basic heat engine that drives the circulation of the globe is the sun um, striking, the, striking the tropics and providing that difference in temperature. So let's run it. Since insulation is strongest when the sun is directly overhead, the equator is heated more strongly than other places on Earth. Heated air rises and cold air sinks, resulting in low surface pressure at the equator and high surface pressure at the poles. The engine of low latitude atmospheric circulation is the Hadley cell. Convection occurs at the thermal equator. Poleward moving air is forced to descend. This produces two subtropical belts of high pressure, centered at about 30 degrees latitude. Surface winds spiral out from the subtropical highs, moving toward the equator as well as the mid-latitudes. Above 30 degrees latitude, wind patterns are more complex in a belt of conflict between polar and subtropical air known as the polar front. The latitude at which the sun is directly overhead changes with the seasons. Since Hadley cell circulation is driven by this heating, we can expect elements of the Hadley cell to migrate as well. At high altitude, air moves without the drag of surface friction. This geostrophic wind moves along rather than across the pressure gradient. The westerly flow of upper air frequently forms undulations called Rossby waves. Warm air pushes poleward, while troughs of cold air brought south are pinched off, leaving pools of cool air in the mid-latitudes. All right, now the main thing that that description left off is it, it's basically showed everything. Since happening. insulation is strongest when the sun is directly overhead. Yeah, we know that now. <laughs> One thing it left off is that the sun of the equator is uniform things happening everywhere. But in the tropics, there's variations of sea surface temperatures. There are some places that are hotter than others. And the air that rises up during the convection, during the thunderstorm, is going to rise up most vigorously where there's the greatest amount of heat at the, at, at the ocean surface. And what El Nino and La Nina do is they change where that heat is located. So they change where the major amount of updraft is taking place. And since one of them makes the tropics cold or one makes it hot, they're changing the pole to clear temperature difference, so they're changing the strength of the wind also. So if we go back to the, uh, the slides, the, uh, what we're looking at is, uh, sorry, I'm hitting several buttons simultaneously. Uh, what we're looking at is uh, the uh, upper motion being concentrated far to the west during a uh, line in year at the same time as the tropics are cool. So that makes the, the jet stream weaker, it makes the jet stream farther north because we've got less of this strong flow. So storms tend to miss us in Texas because they're moving farther north with the jet stream. Um, secondly, um, that, this changes the pattern of um, the waves of the jet stream that were showed up near the end. And we happen to be just in the, we happen to be just in the right place down, downstream so that we're in a place where a ridge tends to develop. So La Nina is making the jet stream farther north where we are 
and that means we end up with a cooler, drier, sorry, warmer and drier winter. In the summer, as the animation showed, jet stream everywhere moves farther north, and we're we're out of the influence of the jet stream. So that's why La Nina and El Nino don't affect our summertime weather as much as they do our wintertime weather. Now, if we were designing a climate system, we'd probably prefer it to be the opposite way because what we'd really like to know is how much rain is going to be during the summertime when we need it the most, rather than the wintertime. But unfortunately, winter is when we can uh, see the strongest effects of La Nina. In the summer, uh, there's more of a sort of feedback that takes place. Um, so we start off with the, with the solar energy coming to the ground, and in a typical year, some of that energy will go into heating the ground and the air above the ground, and some of it will go into evaporating moisture from the ground. Well, first thing that happens if you have start off the summertime with less moisture in the ground, then the plants will be uh, utilizing moisture at a lower rate will be less moisture to evaporate and so a greater amount of the sun's energy goes into heating the air and the ground making the uh, air temperature higher. Second thing that happens is with less moisture there's less clouds so you have a greater amount of energy making it to the ground which means the amount of heat available for the ground and the atmosphere is even higher yet. And of course, hotter conditions accelerate the evaporation of the cloud. A little moisture is still available. So we don't get very many thunderstorms and we stay dry. It's this positive feedback loop that uh, pretty much takes a tropical storm for us to break out of once it gets started. Also, as the whole air column warms up, high pressure builds up a loft, which tends to unfortunately circle disturbances away from us. So last year, the closest the tropical storm got was in South Texas. And it hit land, and, it, and that was about all that was to it. Um, now, you, sometimes you hope there might be rain from hurricanes. Um, it's like, and indeed, people were, some people were hoping for a hurricane last year. <laughs> and indeed, one, one effect of La Nina, because of the way it affects the wind patterns globally, is it tends to allow for more hurricanes to develop in the Atlantic. And I used to think that was a good thing, given more chance of rain, but it turns out that the, the warmer Atlantic means you have more thunderstorms there and less thunderstorms elsewhere, which is over land where we are. So all the action is over water, and we get fewer thunderstorms when we have a, uh, a warm Atlantic and an active hurricane season. So unfortunately, um, even though hurricanes may go up, our rainfall does not. Now this uh, feedback between rainfall and moisture and temperature in the summertime means that it's not an accident that we were both the driest ever and the hottest ever. In fact, uh, you, you notice these, these plots here, they weren't just randomly scattered, they were sort of a lie along a, a diagonal indicating the, the wetter it is, the cooler it is in the summertime. So uh, if you knew that we were going to be so dry, you probably could have predicted that it was going to also be record heat. And you wouldn't have been far off in, in, in the temperature you'd expect from, from that amount of rainfall. Um, I've estimated about four degrees of our excess heat <coughs> this summer was due to uh, being about six inches below the normal amount of summertime rainfall. Uh, here's another way of looking at those temperatures. Summertime temperatures from 1895 to present. Um, I'd like to say this point was an accident, but no, that was 2011 again. Um, not part of a trend, but sitting out there on its own. You notice there's a lot of variation from year to year in, in summer temperatures. If you take out the effect of rainfall, most of that variation goes away. And uh, you're left with uh, something we see um, not just in the summer, but also through annual temperatures, which is um, fairly stable temperatures over the historical record in the state of Texas. They tended to be a little warm during the 1950s. Um, the coolest decade was the 1970s. And then uh, since then, uh, a steady rise, and they've probably now exceeded 1950s temperatures recently. 
Um, to look at look at this more on a regional basis, I've divided the state into eight different sectors and looked at the, taking the long-term climate stations from each one of these sectors. And uh, the color coding uh, will be East Texas is going to be the uh, green curve on these diagrams. And this is kind of busy. Let's just, this is basically a mashup of two different diagrams. Over on the left is his history, the historical data. So we're looking at uh, temperature. Each line is a degree Fahrenheit. And uh, each one of the eight regions is plotted here. For East Texas, um, the warmest uh, decade on record was back in the 1920s. And uh, it stayed cool until about 1990. And we've seen some rising temperatures since then, but still nothing uh, close to what the records show almost 100 years ago. And most of the rest of the state, um, there's been more of a rise recently. And uh, in fact, uh, every other section of the state is above where it was back in the 1950s. Now, what I've plotted here on the right are climate model projections based on um, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas increases in the future. And uh, if, you used, if you used a model or you used uh, um, another estimate, it probably come out about the same. Uh, I won't have time to get into the details of where these come from or how reliable they are um, during my talk. I'm going to talk about it afterwards in the Q&A. That's fine. Um, for now, let's just treat this as a, as a, a possibility, uh, which it certainly is. And what it projection shows an increase at the same rate over the next 50 years or so as has been observed in Texas during the past 30 or 40 years. So it's a plausible, reasonable rate of temperature increase, um, which takes us beyond um, our historical experience in terms of temperature. And the impact so far of this rise is only about a degree or so of increase. So going back to what I said with the current drought, the excess temperatures last summer were due to the lack of water not any long-term climate change, except for maybe a degree or so added on to the top of it. But that, that ratio may change in the future. Anyhow, back to the present. Um, as you might imagine, uh, the climate 50 or 70 years from now has little relevance to what's going to happen in the next few months. Um, and we'll focus on La Nina um, to make our forecast, because you saw it has a big impact on our weather. Actually, the reason La Nina and El Nino are so important in forecasting is, is that there are two things going on. First is, we can actually forecast El Nino and La Nina in advance. So that it, uh, uh, we, can, we can run ocean models and get a good sense of what's going to happen several months into the future with La Nina. So it's possible to use the future state of El Nino and La Nina as a forecasting tool. And secondly, the um, El Nino and La Nina have a fairly big impact on the atmosphere. So it's useful to use it as a forecasting tool. So possible and useful. Um, but of course, there are lots of other things that affect our weather on a seasonal basis. And so since we're only able to forecast one of them, there's a lot that's being left out. That means that any forecast is going to be inherently pretty vague and possibly inaccurate. Now, the same thing applies, by the way, to the climate change projections. There are lots of things that affect climate. Uh, carbon dioxide happens to be the one that's the most predictable. Um, we can't predict solar radiation. We can't predict volcanoes. Um, and so um, it's only one of several things that are going to affect our climate in the future. But it's the one that we can forecast. Uh, and it's also one that's going to have a significant effect, so it's worth forecasting for. So projections that you hear about for climate change are projections based upon one or two variables. And the actual climate is going to be somewhere different because of the interaction of everything. Just like our weather in March is going to be influenced by La Nina, but what we actually get is going to be a combination of lots of factors. OK, well, this is the current situation out in the Pacific Ocean. On the bottom is the departure from normal of temperatures. And you see blues here indicating the <laughs> normal. That means La Nina conditions. 
And just seeing this and knowing that La Nina means less aqua means that this indicates we should be having a relatively dry winter. Um, it's actually been pretty close to normal. October through January, rainfall averaged over Texas is almost right on the money for normal conditions. So last year we were unlucky with La Nina, and this year we're lucky with it. I'm glad that that has balanced out. Certainly no guarantee it would have happened. Uh, the way we estimate the magnitude of La Nina is by taking the average of departure from normal within this box along the, along the tropics. Um, and uh, the, I'm going to skip over that part. Um, what's been going on with it, I'm faster than these slides. What's been going on with La Nina over the past year, um, we had a moderate to strong La Nina a year ago. And then we warmed up to within about a half degree of normal. That's the, that's the threshold for calling it a La Nina event. It was more than a half a degree colder than normal. Um, summertime, we're neutral. And then unfortunately, temperatures dropped off along the tropics again. And we've been in the moderate La Nina since that time. Um, and now it's perhaps showing some signs of warming up. This is a whole bunch of model forecasts from a variety of approaches, but they all agree that uh, we should get back above the La Nina threshold sometime during the spring and return to neutral conditions. Um, of course, La Nina wouldn't be affecting as much beyond the spring anyway because the jet stream is too far north. Um, and this may or may not hold well for uh, what happens next year uh, because, as you saw, we've gone through this once before where it recovered in the summer and then dropped off again in the, in the winter. Unfortunately, we won't be able to forecast next fall and winter until we get past the spring because what happens in the ocean is fairly strongly affected by weather conditions which aren't predictable more than a week or two in advance. So once we get past that period of unpredictability, things will settle down and we'll be able to have some longer term projections we can rely on. At present, all I can do is rely on past statistics which says that uh, four or five out of the last 10 uh, instances of a double La Nina have actually had a triple. So, decent chance of having another La Nina next year. Anyhow, the projections for this season, uh, you can see drier than normal conditions are, are likely across the southern United States. Um, as I mentioned, this corner of the state is less affected by La Nina than other parts of the state, so uh, we're more into the uh, uh, equal chances section of the map. And the projection in the springtime, unfortunately, um, with May and June being the wettest months of the year for most of Texas, has an uh, enhanced chance of below normal rainfall also. Let's see. Now, these maps look semi-intuitive, but actually the 40 means there's a 40% chance of, or greater, of the uh, rainfall during this three-month period falling into the driest third of historical <coughs> rainfall events during the past 30 years. Got that? <laughs> so, I prefer to say it's kind of dry and leave it that. <coughs> um, but basically the tilting of the odds. And as I mentioned, it's actually been fairly wet and uh, fairly uh, fairly cool, so this has been an unusual La Nina, as can sometimes happen. Um, now I want to let you in on uh, an experiment that, that we're working on right now. Um, these are some preliminary results, so don't tell anybody. Um, trying to address the question, how, how much of our weather is controlled by the sea surface temperatures? If you could predict the ocean perfectly, would you know what was going to happen? Uh, we certainly know there's some influence there with La Nina and El Nino, but how much, how much is, is really going on? So here's, here's the experiment that we did. I uh, took a, a weather prediction model, the same sort of model that would be used to forecast the weather a few days in advance. It will simulate the evolution of storm systems. It will simulate where thunderstorms take place and, and simulate changes in the jet stream position, the whole bit. And, uh, Started out in 1950 and ran it for 54 years with the sea surface temperatures specified as what actually happened during that period. 
and see what happens to the weather. Now, what actually happens will be quite random because the weather is going to evolve in some random fashion which will only be slightly influenced by the sea surface conditions. So to get past that randomness, you can actually do, repeat this experiment um, 85 times with slightly different starting conditions for the atmosphere. And the weather in any given day in each of those 85 runs will look completely different from each of the other 85 runs. But if you average them all together, you'll be averaging out all that random weather stuff and you'll find out how much of what's happening is actually related to variations of temperature in different parts of the oceans. So here's, uh, here's the result. This is the average of each of the years worth of runs. So there's 54 dots here, one for each of the 54 years. And we're plotting um, the values of the El Nino index from left to right. Anything to the left of minus 0.5 is La Nina condition. And what we're measuring is the 12 month rainfall. Remember, it was very dry in Texas, actually that point on this graph would be here. We had a moderate to strong La Nina, and the rainfall was about 60% below normal. And what the model does is it simulates drier conditions systematically during La Nina events than El Nino. So that's consistent with what we saw historically when we average things together. So that correlation is not just a statistical accident. There's a cause and effect there because if we run the model with La Nina, it averages out drier than if you run it with an El Nino. So that's, it's always nice to have a physical basis for making predictions rather than just a statistical one. Now, each one of those points is an average of 85 runs. Here's the highest few of those 85. Uh, you still see that slope, but the point I want to make is that no matter how strong a line in you to put into the model, it was always possible in a few of the years to get above normal rainfall in Texas. So La Nina doesn't guarantee a dry year. And in fact, historically, four out of five La Nina years actually come out above normal rainfall for the state. So again, the model is agreeing with what we see historically. Um, <laughs> on the dry side, just about everything can be drier than normal, even during an El Nino. Although none of the models managed to pick out an event during the um, 54 times 85 runs, you can do that math if you want to. Um, during that maybe 3,000, 4,000 model run, none of them produced a year as dry as what we saw during, 19, to, during 2011. So um, La Nina was part of the answer, certainly not the complete answer, and it's going to take a while to figure out what the complete answer was. Uh, certainly, bad luck has something to do with it, just as it has something to do with this year so far being close to normal. Okay, um, I mentioned warming temperatures. Um, the picture on the long term for rainfall is not nearly so clear because Texas is on the boundary between where the long term projections project drier conditions and where they project weather conditions. That's true both for uh, um, the winter time and the summer time. So we look at trends of rainfall across the state, the projections are well within the historical envelope. So even if climate change has a big impact on temperatures, uh, as near as the, at least the majority of models, will have a fairly small effect on rainfall. Uh, we don't need to worry about this as much as uh, be grateful for this say, the 10 to 15 percent increase of rainfall over the past century that's been observed in every region of the state. And uh, the other thing to point out is there's uh, quite a bit of variation from decade to decade. So that uh, uh, this is smooth over 20 year periods um, and you know, variations of 10 to 20 percent of rainfall over 20 year periods. Uh, so this natural variability um, is much more important on the short term, then the, um, the climate change is going to be for rainfall. Now, let's get to what's causing that variation on a, on a multi-year time scale. Okay, we'll start with the observations and then go to the models again. And we'll wrap it up right after that. So here's, uh, 
We take the southern United States, this black patch here, and look at the, the correlation between uh, basically flood or drought conditions here and sea surface temperatures throughout the globe. We try to find that there is some, some relationship between those two. And there's a lot of color here. Um, the reds correspond to places where warm temperatures are, are seen whenever it's wet in the southern United States. And the blues are places where cold temperatures are observed whenever it's wet in the southern United States. Um, this part probably isn't much of a surprise. La Nina tends to be cool is when it's cooler than normal and it's also dry here. So that fits. Um, I didn't talk about the Indian Ocean affecting us. And the reason I did is because it probably doesn't affect us. Um, if you pick out the patterns of temperatures where things tend to change simultaneously in different parts of the ocean, you actually, you actually can extract this particular pattern, which what it says is that whenever you have warmer than normal temperatures in the tropics and the Pacific, it also tends to be warmer than normal in the uh, Indian Ocean and colder than normal in these spots. So um, not all of this map is um, all of these parts of the globe affecting us. It's actually mainly this part of the ocean affecting us and the rest of the ocean being along for the ride. It happens to be changing, having temperatures change at the same time. Now, time series of this is kind of interesting. You see a lot of up and down over the past century. This is uh, basically the, how strong this pattern is in any given year. And the up and downs correspond to El Nino and La Nina. Positive is El Nino, negative is La Nina. So when we saw these dips down here, that's when it tends to be dry. Now in addition to this annual stuff, there's also some stuff going on with slower times. You can see it tends to be positive during this period, it tends to be negative during this period, tends to be positive during this period. So there's multi-decade phases of um, warm conditions in the tropical Pacific and cold conditions in the tropical Pacific, which are related to the rainfall we get here in Texas. Um, a couple other patterns that emerge, one is just uh, the same as warm everywhere, that's basically the, the large-scale warming signal, which is pretty steady increase without much interannual variation. This other one here is the Atlantic Ocean, which um, shows up statistically related to our rainfall. When the Atlantic's warm, we tend to be dry. And there's also this multi-decade variation where it was warm in the 50s and 60s and cool in the 80s and 90s. And that one needs more work because if you plug in the ocean temperatures in the model, you don't get dry conditions here. So is this a historical accident or is there some factor that's affecting both of them? You still got to figure that one out. Uh, but if you line things up, the Pacific Ocean was especially cold in the 50s and 60s. And the Atlantic Ocean was especially warm in the 50s and early 60s. And you may remember, we had drought in the 50s, drought and record. We also had a four year drought in the early 60s. I shaded in the other periods of frequent drought during the past century. We had uh, mentioned 1917. There's a couple other major drought years in that region period also. It also corresponded to when temperatures tend to be cool in the tropical Pacific, um, but sort of neutral in the Atlantic. And now we have the present, where we've been seeing droughts since 1996, and the Pacific Ocean has indeed turned cooler, and the Atlantic Ocean is warm. So, based on past history and some establish physical relationships, we seem to be in this period of drought susceptibility, not as bad as it was in the 50s and 60s, but, and not very predictable either, uh, but based on what's happened in the past, we tend to get locked into these patterns for, for 15 or 20 years. So, let's put all this together and see what we've got. We've got lighting you back. Uh, which means the drought is likely to continue through most of the state, although so far, money has been good to North Texas, and maybe we're getting out of the drought in this corner of the state. 
We're in a period of drought susceptibility because of the long-term temperature patterns in the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean, which favor drought in the southern U.S. And I don't know how long that period will last, maybe another few years, maybe a decade. Um, there's a lot of work going into trying to forecast those sorts of variations, just like we forecast El Nino and La Nina. Um, we're not there yet. Because it happens so slowly, it'll be, it'll be a while before we can tell how good the forecasts are. Um, so hopefully in a few years, we'll be able to make that sort of forecast. Uh, what we had during this period of drought susceptibility is dry years and wet years. 2004 was wet, 2007 was wet, 2005 and 2006 was dry, and so on and so on. And I don't know whether we'll have the same thing going forward. Looks like we might have a wet year going right now, if we're lucky. But we know from the past, from the 50s and 60s and tree rings well before that, the multi-year droughts are possible. Um, looking at the really long term, I mentioned precipitation changes with climate change are fairly small compared to the variations we normally get. But the rising temperatures mean that evaporation is going to be an increasing component of future droughts. Um, it certainly wasn't the cause of the high temperatures we had last summer, but it didn't help. It added perhaps a degree or so. And in the future, if you're worried about water planting 20, 30 years down the road, we'll be talking about maybe two degrees warmer perhaps three degrees warmer. And it's certainly not going to be a big effect on water supply as population growth, but it's going to be something worth considering because of the evaporation loss from reservoirs and streams, as well as increased demand for, for homes and gardens. So, I just turned off the screen, sorry. Um, that's, uh, as you can see, we don't know, we know a lot more about what has happened than what will happen. It's the nature of the game, unfortunately. Um, and because weather happens and, and drought is a combination of things which tilt us toward drought and then being unlucky with